We don't know exactly when the map was made, nor do we know exactly where it was picked up in the Far East, but we imagine that it was probably made in 1620. It was uh, acquired by a merchant of the English East India Company. It was brought to London, it passed into the hands of Selden, but we don't know exactly how and we don't know exactly when. John Selden was a London lawyer who died in 1657. He made a bequest of his books to the Bodleian Library and they included this map, which is now known as the Selden Map of China. What we can certainly say is that Selden knew a very interesting potential um, source, of, a source of study and scholarship um, when he saw one. His works were things that he'd, he'd collected to help his own scholarship, which was formidable. He's interested in practically everything, but it wouldn't have been at all unusual for somebody like Selden to say, well, if I, if I buy that object, then it will survive to the future and I may acquire the knowledge to, to get to the bottom of its, of its mysteries. Most Chinese maps up to that point had always been of China as the center of the known world. They'd been drawn from the official Chinese point of view where China was the center of everything. If you look at the map, China only occupies a relatively small area in the top half of the map. The first thing you see is the Great Wall of China, and then you see China and its provinces and its rivers, including the Yellow River and its source here to the west. But this is not really the point of the map. It's really a map of the whole of the Far East. And the center of the map is actually not land at all, it's the South China Sea. One of them is to say that there's a lot of enthusiasm in the later 17th and early 18th century to find ancient cultures and represent them in Europe that are other than, than Greek and Roman classical culture. And that's a very strong line in talking about China through the 17th and 18th century um, as an alternative classical culture. And I think that's what Selden is, in a way, is trying to collect. One of the things that has emerged from the research I've done is that things that we consider to be natural circumstances almost, the idea perhaps that China and Japan might be in conflict or hostile with each other, actually are often rather historically determined and often rather short-lasting. In other words, looking at the map gives you that longer-term view, a reminder that the kind of understanding that we have of this immensely important region, the Asia-Pacific region, has to be informed by an understanding that trade routes, relationships, commerce, people engaging with each other has a very long history and the map is a marvellous example of that. You can see the routes by which people left the ports on the coast of China and found their way to various points in the rest of Asia. When one looks at the in some ways rather more conflicted, rather violent 20th century that I've examined in my research, remembering that history that's encapsulated in the map is very important. This is a map drawn by ordinary people. It's drawn by tradesmen tradesmen who simply wanted to uh, illustrate the routes on which they plied their trade. It wasn't a map that was used on board a ship, it was probably a map that was, had an almost a, a half aesthetic function and was probably dis displayed in the house of a rich merchant. So one of the most interesting things for me about the Selden map is the sheer richness of the detailing itself. That the maker or makers of the map have obviously gone to an exorbitant amount of detail, not just to accurately depict the geographical locations of places, but actually they paid such close attention to the topography of those areas, to the flora and fauna, from everything from the leaves of bamboo to um, the palm fronds. And I think it's very important then in terms of an art history context of thinking then about how the maker was relating himself and the wider world. What first appears to be a 15th century map about Chinese trade routes is actually a much more complicated art historical object that attests to sort of cross-cultural flows of knowledge and an exchange of ideas, not just about pictorial representation but about how China visualised itself in relation to the rest of the world. Both in the early 17th and 18th century and in our present moment, we're very preoccupied with trying to find ways of relating to China 
in terms of our own history, but also understanding that, that culture. The map is symbolic of that period when China was a major global trading and maritime power. And I think by understanding that, you also get a wider understanding of why maps might matter in the present day in that still quite conflicted region. Thank you.